since we are in my constituency, my questions are two. I beg you, please. The first one, I'm a farm grow ginger, I have a livestock farm, I have a poultry farm, I sell eggs, and I sell um, yeah, yeah. yams as well. <laughs> <laughs> I want to exp and add value to what I grow so that I can, I can become global. Now, in order to using, efficient, using technology would improve efficiency. Do you have, for us young farmers, to be able to afford efficiency that we can become global? Because we all know interest rates are high and so on and so forth. As I stand here, I cannot walk into any financial institution and ask for a loan. And so what plans do you have for us young entrepreneurs to help us to expand? That's the first one. The second one is, according to Article 1281, the Supreme Court should have no less than nine judges including the Chief Justice. Do you think it should be capped? I'm talking about the appointment of the Supreme Court Justices. Thank you. Those who dominate is those who are able to load as much content as they can. If you consider the share of content uploaded by us in the developing world is minuscule compared to the content that is loaded from abroad. And it's loaded in language that is yes, not in ours. And so, unless we're also able to create our own search engines that are able to do the same searches in our local languages, then it excludes a whole bulk of the illiterate population. And that is where the issue of what language do we use to teach our children. In Africa, you have Ethiopia. Ethiopia teaches their children in Amharic, and Amharic is their national language. And so because everybody speaks Amharic, they break down everything into Amharic for their people. Their search engines translate everything into Amharic for them. But we don't do the same. The argument about whether we should start children, uh, teaching our children in primary school in our local languages or in English is still a debate that is raging. And as long as our children grow and are not able to read and write their local languages, then it means that our languages will continue to die because the languages are only oral. A time will come when plenty of, when some of us die off, our children will not know how to write in Cree or in Gunja or anything. And so that's a warning flag for us because it will continue to make people who have not been to school, are not educated, excluded from the knowledge feast that is taking place in digital space. Yeah. Okay, that is a very important point there. You know, the language that we have, and um, um, Your Excellency, I'm sure you wanted to say Ghanaian languages. Aha, uh -huh, not local languages. Well. <laughs> Ghanaian. Ghanaian. They are Ghanaian languages. Voila. Okay, thank well, you very I'll much. Take that. <laughs> <laughs> if in this day and age we are still saying things like um, um, colonial uh, uh, masters and things like that, it speaks to a long way that we need to cover. So let us begin. I, to use, it, I use it in the context of foreign and local. Uh, uh -huh. yeah, right, so. Okay, that, that is brilliant. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just saying it to the general. Ghanaian languages. Ghanaian languages. Thank you. Thank you. So you have the mic. You came first. So we will take three questions at a time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. And thank you very much, Your Excellency, for the brilliant and powerful presentation you did all of us. My name is Andrew Stable, the Deputy General Secretary for the General Agricultural Workers Union of the TUC. So I'm a trade unionist and you can predict my question there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Um, it's a simple one and direct. What hope will you give to Ghanaian workers uh, in terms of uh, our salaries that are supposed to take us home? It takes us nowhere. Our pensions that are supposed to uh, give us good retirement and then they will start dying immediately when we receive the pension. Your Excellency, uh, I want to give you a one to go, but it's a very friendly one. And this is a very friendly one because there are a lot of trade unions here I'm asking the question for. And I give you one good start for the hopeful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, certainly, as a social democrat, uh, my interests align with the interests of the working class. And so, at any time that we have been in government, and I have been um, privileged to serve in the highest position of the man as president, we have always made it a point to be very consultative with the, working, with the workers of Ghana when it comes to issues of compensation and remuneration. We are always playing with what the economic situation is. And normally when you do that, workers will understand what is available and what is there. For instance, before we did the Sinti Forum, we did a special session for TUC and organized labor, for those of you who were there at the time. And we opened the books to you, we showed you uh, the situation of the economy, what we had inherited, and we decided that we would hold our consultations for salary negotiations the previous year before we put the budget before parliament. And we started to do that. We used to uh, 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 meet together. After negotiations were finished, I used to go as president personally and meet the leadership of organized labor. And we agree on what the minimum wage should be and all that. And we introduced it into parliament in November so that we budget for it in the budget and then we pass the budget, and everybody knows that these are the compensation packages in the budget for us. We'll continue to do that, consult you when it comes to issues of fixing salaries and not doing it unilaterally. We did a, we did a pensions reform, and it was my hope that with the pensions reform and the tier two uh, provident uh, fund on and so forth, it will give workers a better lump sum going home than the former completely snitch pension. If there are issues with that system, we're prepared to sit and look at, at that again and see how we can tweak the system in order that workers can benefit. During COVID, I came up with a suggestion and I said, it's has been contributing for 20 years. And for instance, the private school teachers were laid off because the schools were shut and they stopped paying. And so you have a private school teacher who's been contributing for 20 years and he's temporarily unemployed for a year because of COVID and his school has shut down, he's not being paid. It should be possible for Slate to pay him an allowance during that period when he has been laid off until he gets a job again and then he can continue contributing. These were some of the ideas outside the box that we came up with. And uh, we have hoped that we will get the support of labor so that government will implement it. But like I said, we need to take in this in this period. One of the things we have committed to is to abolish Article 71 uh, uh, remuneration uh, structure and create an independent emolument board. Because today we have two classes of people, those who are under the wages system and we have those who are Article 71. At the 71 emoluments are determined completely differently by a committee set up by the president and then everybody else is under fair wages. So then there's a dichotomy between the allowances of the people up there and the allowances and remuneration of the people down there. And let's get rid of Article 71. Let all of us come under an independent emolument uh, uh, structure so that we all will work together, we'll create together. And when we have created together, we'll share together equitably. And so that's my position. And election of MMDCs, I support it. And actually, we had um, uh, expressed, my party had expressed our support for election of uh, MMPCs. The difference between us and our colleagues in the MPP is that our position was that 
the non-participation of political parties at the local government level should be maintained. And so if assemblymen are standing, let them stand on their individual character. And we suggested the same. If DCs are standing, you can set the qualification. You can say you must have a tertiary education or you must have a degree, a first degree from a recognized university or something like that. But otherwise, if they are qualified, let them stand on their own uh, uh, character and strength. And so that is our position. And when we come, we'll push the constitutional review and try to do the referendum again for election of DCs because when the survey was done, the majority of Ghanaians wanted their DCs elected. Because what happens is right now they are appointed, they serve at the grace and opportunity of the president, and most of them will tell you they are not accountable to you, the ordinary citizen in the district. Their accountability is to the president who appointed them. And so the people should be able to hold them to account by electing them. If the people elect them, then it means that they'll be accountable to the people. Because if they have to stand for re-election, they have to go back and account to the people what they have done with the mandate that they were given. Exactly. So we support election of MMDCs, but on a non-partisan basis. That's our position. Then, um, how do we improve communication skills for um, uh, students? That's a very wide and broad question. Uh, but just before I came in, I was talking to the provost, and um, he was talking about the um, uh, intention to set up a digital village here on campus to allow all students who uh, live on this campus to be able to take advantage of the digital evolution that is taking place and be able to visit this village and improve their skills in communications and all that. That would be one major step to be able to do that. There are many other ideas, but I think uh, they will come up in the course of time. Okay, so... Um, the fiscal education instructor, yeah, about um, the cost of uh, data uh, in uh, Ghana. Uh, it's a general problem. And I think that the NCA should be doing something about it. It makes it very difficult for there to be equitable access, especially for poor rural people. And that's why when we set up the NCA and we also diversified the multiplicity of operators in the telecom, telecom sector, the idea was to create competition. And competition would lead to lower tariffs. I must admit that there are certain costs that are escalating because of our poor management of the economy. I mean, if the CD had continued to be between four and six CDs to the dollar, nobody would have any reason to increase you know, their tariffs in respect of data. Of course, their spare parts are not manufactured locally. The towers that are set up to extend uh, uh, telecom services are not manufactured locally, we import virtually everything. And so everything is also hinged on government student management of the economy. But we inserted something there, for instance, the GIFIC, uh, the Ghana Integrated Fund for Electronic Communication, is supposed to take 1% of the uh, uh, gross revenue of the telecommunications companies. This should enable GIFEC to put in interconnectivity in different parts of the country, especially in public institutions. And because we are putting in that infrastructure ourselves, we should be able to regulate it in a way that we pass on the benefit to the consumer so that costs are much lower than they normally would be if they were getting it from the telcos. So these are areas that we intend to explore. And I don't see anything wrong with government subsidizing access to Wi-Fi for public institutions like the University of Ghana and other educational institutions. There should be hotspots. There should be hotspots where you can go and stand and do your uh, whatever data uh, thing you're doing and then go back and, and, and relax. And so these are ideas that we should nurture and expand. Uh, with regards to the farmer, farmer John. Somebody added yam. I think you've been bringing yam and distributing to people, yeah? Okay. 
Well, I'm in the same situation as you because I'm a farmer myself. I'm sure you know that. Welcome to the club. So I'm a farmer too. I'm a colleague farmer. It is my interest, in my interest, to also make sure that farmers, and I'm not saying only farmers, but agribusiness entrepreneurs are able to flourish. What we do in the past, and that thing is stick with planting for food and jobs. A minister of agriculture said they had created 700,000 jobs in the agriculture value chain. They asked him, how, how, where are the jobs? How did you do it? They said, oh, we distributed 70,000 bags of fertilizer. And if each bag of fertilizer produces a certain number of jobs, if you multiply it, you get 700,000. That's how he calculated 700,000 bags. He then realized that a certain 80-30% of that fertilizer ended up in Mali and Burkina Faso and other places because party Aparachiki were giving the fertilizer to uh, distribute and they just smuggled it out and sold it for safer and came and changed it back to cities and enjoyed their lives. <laughs> and so just giving subsidies to the farmers, but at the end of it, leaving them to the mercy of the middlemen and all those other people, you really would not create sustainable food production. Because the farmer gets subsidized fertilizer, yes, he produces and everything. And then at the end of the farming season, the markets are close to him. You can't bring your maize into any market in Accra and say you're coming to sell. Because the green mothers would not allow you to sell in those markets. Farmers, in some places, they have farmers markets. We don't have them here. Any farmer can bring his produce there and come and sell. Unfortunately, we don't have that here. And how many farmers are going to be able to, able to hire a truck and bring their produce here? Their produce probably might not be as much to be able to hire a, a, a destination. That's why buffer stock was put in. Unfortunately, normally when you use a state model for anything, it doesn't work properly. My brother, who is also a farmer, Michael, harvested maize, he had 1,000 mini bags of maize. And he said, oh, this one, I'll sell it to buffer stock. He went to buffer stock and he said, we well, don't buy maize from farmers. Go to one of our agents and sell your maize to him. And so he goes to the agent and the price the agent is quoting is not profitable for him because then the agent will take it and he sells it at a higher price to buffer stock uh, company. So there are a lot of bottlenecks in the chain. We need to make, make um, our culture a whole value chain. So it's not just producing and leave to the vagaries of the market. It is producing and making sure that there's an off-taker who will take it, add value to it, and take it to the next level of processing. I produced, I did um, almost 200 acres of soya bean this year. And wow. I got about almost 2,000 bags of, of soya. I sold it to a factory that extracts soya oil and so they bottle vegetable, uh, soya vegetable cooking oil. And then the cake is uh, processed as feed for poultry farmers. We need to expand on more of such agribusinesses so that for everything that we produce, there's an off-taker who's willing to take it off the farmer at a minimum guaranteed price so that the farmer has enough capital to reinvest in what the next farming season. Just by changing the seeds of the farmer, he's able to increase production. There was a farmer that um, was, had been using the same seed for 20 years and was getting, let's say, uh, six bags per acre. Just by giving him improved seeds, his production jumped by uh, almost 100%. And so there are little interventions that we can do, but the most important thing is to make sure that we improve the agri value chain. You, for instance, there are simple machines for processing your ginger into ginger oil, ginger powder, ginger paste not only for local consumption, but for export. And that is the reason why when I was president, we set up the Ghana Exim Bank to help people like you. Because if you go to the bank today, they're going to lend to you at 32% interest. What profit are you going to make as an agribusinessman at 32% interest borrowing from the bank? And yet Ghana Exim can give you that same facility at 11%. And you should be able to set up your uh, factory, nothing huge, but a small processing mill that is able to process your products and also to buy off your uh, uh, neighbors who are producing the same thing and process for the market. 
And so that's where our emphasis is going to be. It's not going to be on this political subsidiary, 1D, 1F, 1 district, 1 factory. We're going to target the actual agribusiness people, private sector, and make sure that they are putting in a place where they can add value to whatever project, whatever produce is being done in that area. I believe that every region must have a regional economic forum that looks at the comparative advantages it has. You come from OT, and OT produces a lot of ginger, they produce a lot of cassava, they produce a lot of maize, they produce rice. And so you must look at what the region has a comparative advantage to produce and you must put the processing in that region to be able to buy the produce of the farmers and process it so that they can have that. The Supreme Court gave a bottom number, the Constitution gave a bottom number to the Supreme Court, but they don't give an upper number. But since and the Constitution came into uh, being, all presidents have kept a number below 15, uh, except for the current president. And um, when the Constitution Review Committee, headed by Professor Fiajo, went around the whole country and canvassed opinions, the general opinion that came up was that we should cap the Supreme Court at 15. And so, in Prof's time, Prof received the report of the review commission. And so he never appointed about 50. I don't think he even got to 30. And then I came into office and I had the 15 number in mind, even though it is, the constitution had not been amended, it was my decision that we will not go above 15 because if that was the general opinion of Ghanaians and we were going to amend the constitution in the future to cap it, then we just keep it at 15. Unfortunately, a president will come who will go above that. And so I agree with you that we must up it. Wait and let some other president to come and also make some appointments. Then after that, we'll all agree and we'll cap it. <laughs> after that one, we'll all agree, we'll cap it. And then we'll let it, by natural attrition, fall to the number that we all agree. Um, review of free SHS. I don't say I'll review free SHS. I said I'm going to call stakeholders together. And stakeholders means the teachers, the students, the parents, the experts in education. Because SHS is consuming more than half of the total budget for education. And yet, we're not getting the benefits of spending more than half our budget on education. Basic education is suffering because we're spending all the money on SHS. And so the basic students have not gotten textbooks for more than five years. They don't have the core textbooks. Their capitation grant is in arrears. They are, the schools have no tables and chairs. Uh, schools and the trees are springing up again because we're not building classrooms for them. And so I'm saying that let all of us come as stakeholders. I don't say I will review. I said Ghanaians will come together as stakeholders and will review the implementation. We're not reviewing free SHS, we're reviewing the implementation of free SHS to see what is not being implemented properly. Are we getting value for the money we're putting in, putting more than 50% of our education budget in secondary education? Are we getting value for money how do we get value for money? How do we make it a more useful learning experience for the children? How do we improve the infrastructure in the schools so that they have uh, dormitory block, dormitories to sleep in, they have dining halls to eat in? That is the kind of review we're talking about. And that review is not by me. It is by all of us who are stakeholders to um, uh, uh, the secondary education. I still have a daughter who is in the, sec in the secondary level. So I have an interest to make sure that second education is provided optimally and that the state and our children and parents who should be benefiting from it are getting the full benefit for that SHS and uh, for that free SHS. Why would I abolish it? I launched the free SHS. The only difference between us and our colleagues is that the constitution said progressively free. And so we were starting the free SHS but at the same time, expanding the infrastructure 
so that as the numbers of children increase, we will not get the kind of problems that we are facing. Unfortunately, we left office, a new government came. They said they were starting it afresh. They canceled all the, the children who were on bursaries. We had added boarding students for the first time. 140,000 of them were on bursary for free, progressively free SHS. These students were already there. We said these students, they kind of canceled that system and said they were going to introduce it within three years. And they did within uh, three years. The quality of the food is bad. Parents are spending more money feeding their, ch uh, their, their kids. Indeed, parents, on the average, parents are spending more today than they were spending when we were paying fees. And so how do we make it more beneficial? But of course, our opponents, uh, uh, sorry, our colleagues. <laughs> Serial level <laughs> because I was going to say we'll take political advantage, and that's why I use opponents. Our colleagues will take political advantage over that so that even a professor will say his understanding of review means to cancel. I mean, everybody has uh, uh, an English dictionary, or just Google the word review, and I, I've, I've never seen any dictionary that interprets review to mean to abolish. But it's part of the politics that um, um, uh, we play, and um, I think that we should overcome that. Uh, I still say that within 100 days of my becoming president, we're going to call a stakeholders conference on free exchanges <laughs> to review the implementation of bottlenecks so that we can get more uh, uh, benefits from the free SHS. And you'll be surprised. When that conference is called, the head teachers and others who have been suffering in silence will now have the freedom to talk. You'll be surprised at what you're going to hear. Mark my words. When that conference takes place, all of you come and listen. They will now be free to get things off their chest and you wait and hear what they will come and say. This is the New Year School. So we are all learning to say colleagues. For leaves. <laughs> Thank you very much. In in twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen, um, when I read the State of the Nation address, I said that by twenty twenty, I've forgotten which year. I think by 2020, um, government will no longer accept cash for any payment. That was the target. I said we were going to go cashless. And so if you needed any government service, you were not going to be allowed to pay by cash. You had to pay on an electronic platform. And that was to push us to become a cashless society. Um, in most countries that had advanced, you would hardly see people Sometimes if you give a big note, you, you find it very difficult to get uh, a change for a payment that you make because everybody is using an electronic card or using... Sound. Is it? Everybody is using an electronic or a mobile platform. And so the intention was for us to go cashless. And you didn't need to panic people who had listened to you and decided to follow your advice to go cashless. You don't punish them by imposing tax on them. If I go to buy fuel today and I pay cash, I don't pay that 1.5% e-levy. But somebody who we encourage to go electronic, to go mobile money, if he goes to buy fuel 
and he pays from his mobile money platform, he pays 1% for the telco cost, and then pays another 1.5% for government's e-levy. So the one who has complied and has gone electronic, you are charging 2.5%, you know, for making a payment. And so what are Ghanaians doing? They're going to merchants and cashing out, and they come and pay cash like everybody else. And so that huge dream that they had that levy was the panacea to anything. Human beings out, they will find a way out of anything. And nobody's favorite thing is paying taxes. And so why would I pay 2.5% on any transaction that I make with my mobile uh, money platform when somebody who's going around paying cash does not pay that? And imagine that that is in addition to COVID-1 levy, it's in addition to uh, uh, so many other taxes that have been, have been brought on. You go to a supermarket and look at the levies that you have to pay. Then in addition to that, me who I'm paying with mobile money has another 2.5% on top of all that. And that's why I said it is an inequitable tax. Fair, it's not a fair tax. It prevents people from the uptake of our moving towards a cashless society. And so when NDC comes, we will remove that tax. I've said it. Thank you. Uh, there's one more, the last one. Uh, it's about the North. The disparity between the North and South of this country has been um, uh, historical. It is not a recent creation. The first schools um, um, came to the South of Ghana in the 1800s. The first school came to Northern Ghana in 1945. And I think that was uh, the Tamale School or the Salaka School or one of them. In my family, I'm the second generation of educated people. And I'm lucky because my father was one of those, he was a grandson of a chief, and they came to the chief's palaces to grab children to go to school. And the children were all ran away. But unfortunately, my father was one of those who was grabbed, and he was sent to school. <laughs> and so because he was sent to school, I also was sent to school. But for many of my colleagues, that I went to school with, they are the first generation of educated people in their family. And that is why on independence, Nkuma used the Northern fee-free education system, and that was supposed to spread education in the North and make the North catch up with the South. Unfortunately, people did not understand it, and so they kept railing against it and all that. But be that as it may, one of the gaps between the North and the South is due to education. The second one too is due mainly to, to the environment. It's savanna based and as you know geographically for those of you who studied geography, um, the south is a more uh, resource rich area than the northern savanna things. And especially as the, the rainfall pattern is fixed a certain number of months in the year. And after the rainfall, um, the, the main state of the people is agriculture. So after the rainfall and they harvested the crops, there's nothing left to do. And so a lot of them used to, in the past, migrate downwards to look for jobs in the south and work for cash and go back up to continue their farming. Unfortunately, since Ghana became independent, all our investments in the south. Anybody wants to build a factory, he comes to build in Tijama, in Accra, in uh, uh, Takade, in that area. So if you're not a socialist state and uh, people can move freely in the country, where would people move to? They would drift to where jobs are available because all our businesses are here. All governments, the bulk of government investment is in the south. And so until we balance out, and that is why SADA was created, the Savannah Associated Development Authority, to invest both in income generation and also improving infrastructure. Unfortunately, it was scrapped, and they've created three different authorities, uh, coastal, middle belt, 
uh, northern. So the north does not get any advantage more than any other part of the country. And so all you're doing is you're just continuing with the same iniquity. But if we develop a specific investment program for the north, we can be able to turn things around. Because there was a time when people used to migrate from the south to work in the north. When I was growing up in school, my father was a rice farmer. He had a rice factory. He used to produce all the rice we ate in this country and even used to export rice to Burkina Faso. We had the vegetable oil mills, which was set up by Kwame Nkrumah. It was producing uh, share oil, granite oil, all kinds of oil. We had several factories. We had the cotton generous. There were three of them, one in Tamale, one in Tumu, one in Bongatanga, milling uh, cotton for the textile factories in the south. And so people used to move from here to go and work in the north. And I remember in those days, if a civil servant was transferred to the north, he was reluctant to go. But after they forced him to go, after several years, they said, oh, you're on transfer back to Accra. He said, I won't come. Why won't he come? He won't come because he was making money. The rice mills were working. They were buying the rice of the farmers. A civil servant to go to the north, plant 20 acres of rice, and he'll make more money than his whole salary for the year. So judges, uh, uh, teachers, uh, doctors, everybody was uh, farming and making a lot of money. We can recapture really those days if we really target that we're going to do something uh, in that area. Cotton educated a lot of my colleagues. And cotton is a crop that does not interfere with their food production because it doesn't like too much water. And so they plant their maize, their millet, their everything. And then when the rainy season is coming to a stop, they put the cotton in. And the cotton catches the rest of the water. Because when the uh, cotton balls start coming out, if it rains, it will destroy them. And so the timing for the cotton season is at the end of the harvest of their crops. And every farmer that has a crop will put cotton in. And we'll have a state, take it to Ghana Cotton Company, we eat, and he gets extra money to pay the fees of his children and put food on the table for, for them. And so we can turn things around in the northern part. The Kaya Yedin used to come down because by, by day to do on the farms, you go and work for it, for, and you collect your money, and you come home. And you make as much money as when you come and carry. Uh, uh, head loads of things here in Makola Market. And so if we deliberately look at the structure and productivity in the north, we'll balance out the uh, uh, um, development of our country and we'll not have as many people, if even not that people are going to go to the north and migrate to look for work, at least we'll have people coming from there to the south to come and look for work. And so it's something that must happen over time, it must be consistent be part of our development plan, and I'm happy, happy that in the 40-year national development plan, there was a certain specific uh, focus that investments must be spread out across the country, not only in the coastal areas in the southern part. Great. And as we are talking about farming, I think I should let my voice be heard because I think that this